Welcome back to HVAC Review. As promised today, I will be conducting an in-depth review of the Daikin Fit Aurora Cold Climate Heat Pump. Before we dive in, please note that Daikin did not sponsor us for this recording, nor they provided us with free equipment. In this video, I will reveal how the system was born. We're gonna pull the covers off and take a look at the components. I will show you exactly how the system will perform as the outer temperature drops to minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit. And as we getting closer to freezing point, it does something absolutely fascinating. Will it provide heat as the temperature drops below minus 13 degrees? Can you actually replace your gas furnace or oil burner or a dual fuel system still necessary? Keep watching and you'll find out. So we had the Aurora system here in the studio for about two weeks waiting for a review. However, things got switched around and it had to be installed. It was actually installed at a ski resort about 4,500 feet of elevation. So the reason it looks a little bit different than the stock version because we needed to have wind baffles. The average temperature at the resort is actually lower than Boston, Massachusetts. Additionally, higher elevation means stronger winds and the proximity of the snow cannons means that the area receives more snow than usual. Therefore, the wind baffles were absolutely necessary in this case. Now, the Aurora has some truly unique features, such as communication boost mode, cooling or heating boost mode, swing compressor, and advanced dehumidification function in cooling mode. These features are particularly handy, especially in humid climates, but if you live in a dry climate, the system is also compatible with humidifiers. So since the Aurora is a communicating system, it will maximize three of the four air conditioning principles. This means the system will move air around better, dehumidify better, especially in humid climates, and filter the air better. And it prevents temperature swings. So communicating systems are designed to sense the thermal load or heat load of your house and only use the bare minimum power needed to maintain the set temperature. If the load is low, the system might just run at 10% capacity because it doesn't have to ramp up. And it only ramps up when it's absolutely necessary to keep up with the set temperature. If you want to learn more about communicating inverters, please check out the link in the description below. When it comes to the Daikin Fit, we discuss features, part supply, warranty, efficiency, and the Daikin Cloud, which enables all the dealers to run remote diagnostics. Unbelievable feature. So before we begin, let's cover some basics. What really distinguishes a cold climate heat pump from a regular heat pump is that a CCHP will deliver its full nominal capacity at five degrees Fahrenheit. Now, does that mean it will stop heating if the temperature drops below that point? Absolutely not. Keep watching and you will see. Now, EVI, or Enhanced Vapor Injection, was actually invented in the 1970s. It's quite hard to understand what took 50 years to come up with this technology. Millions of gas furnaces and oil burners were sold, and no one ever taught to develop this technology? And add few minor components to a regular heat pump to make it compatible with humid climates? Now, if you know the answer, you can leave it in the comments below. How is it even possible that in the Western world, especially here in the US, we invented everything, I mean everything, but somehow we missed the mark of developing cold climate heat pumps 40 years ago? What truly went wrong, I'm not entirely sure. Perhaps we became too comfortable, focusing on sales and sales and sales, while innovation was slowly fading away. And we got to a point where the Secretary of Energy, Jennifer Granholm, literally had to reach out to HVAC manufacturers to develop the cold climate heat pumps. In my opinion, she was fully aware that the technology was out there, just needed to be fine-tuned and tested. Now, Daikin was one of the companies accepted the challenge. Now, they tested various prototypes from Minnesota, Wisconsin, and all the way up to Quebec. There is one thing that I must emphasize when it comes to the Daikin Aurora pricing. As of right now, while most manufacturers who design cold climate heat pumps price their equipment very high, while the Aurora falls into the mid-range. Yet at the same time, the system is exceptionally advanced. <laughs> 
Now, if you look at the components of a communicating cold climate heat pump versus a regular heat pump, even if you're a pro, you might have a hard time telling what the difference is. Now, let's take a look how the system compares to a conventional heat pump. Now, I have two systems here. Both systems have identical nominal tonnage. The Aurora is 19 CR2, while the generic heat pump is 15.2 CR2. The generic version is actually a very good heat pump and I have nothing against it whatsoever. Now remember that every ton is 12,000 BTUs and a two ton unit is 24,000 BTUs. Now a few basic principles here. The colder the outdoor temperature, the more heating power a heat pump loses. The same principle applies in cooling mode. The hotter the outdoor temperature, the more cooling power the system will lose. Now let's take a look how the Aurora performs in heating mode. At an outdoor temperature of 65 degrees, it outputs 31.3 thousand BTUs, which is a little over two and a half ton. At 50 degrees, it still maintains over two tons, providing 25.2 thousand BTUs. At 47 degrees, it reaches its nominal capacity, which is exactly two tons, 24 thousand BTUs. The kilowatt rating, as you can see it on the screen, and the coefficient of performance, or COP, is an impressive 4.48, insanely efficient. Now compare this to a genetic heat pump system at the same outdoor temperature of 47 degrees Fahrenheit, drops to 23,000 BTUs, as you can see on the chart. Now remember, it's not even freezing outside yet. As the temperature gets colder at 45 degrees Fahrenheit, the BTUs of the Aurora drops to 23,000 BTUs. At 40 degrees, we're down to 21.5 thousand BTUs. And suddenly, the system does something very, very mysterious. The real monster is about to wake up. As we get closer to freezing point at 35 degrees Fahrenheit, a two-ton Aurora becomes a three and a half ton heat pump, outputting 41.8 thousand BTUs. At 30 degrees, we're still over three ton, at 25 degrees, we are exactly at three ton. At 17 degrees, we're still over two and a half ton, while the other system running at nearly one ton capacity. At 10 degrees, we're still over two tons. At five degrees Fahrenheit, the system continued to deliver its full nominal heating capacity. At zero degrees, it falls just below two tons. At minus five degrees Fahrenheit, drops below two tons, but still remains over one and a half ton. At 20,000 BTUs, at minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit, it still produces just below one and a half ton of heating power. Unbelievable. And these systems just appeared on the market. The future looks absolutely amazing. But the question remains the same, do you really need a dual fuel system? Or this Aurora system will provide adequate heat? Keep watching and you'll find out. Now let's start with the coil. As you can see, this coil is a monster. They added an extra layer, which is clearly visible here. There are two unusually large fans with epoxy sealed brushless fan motors. Now these fan blades have notches on the leading edge to make them quieter. We've got a huge reversing valve here. There are also two boards. The boards are separated. This one is the communication board and this one is the inverter board. The communication terminal on this condenser only requires two wires and we have the main power here, L1 and L2. Now to keep the inverter board cool during the hot summer, Daikin has added a refrigerant cooling loop here. The heat pump is actually shipped with a compressive bracket that needs to be removed before installation. If somebody forgets to remove it, it's probably going to make a lot of noise. Here we have extra refrigerant lines and the liquid line dryer down there. Now the bottom plate heater is actually a setup that I never seen before and I thought it was incredibly clever. They added this hot refrigerant loop to prevent ice from building up in the bottom plate. What I've seen so far is that most of the manufacturers use the resistant heat to prevent ice buildup on the bottom plate. As we explained in the last Daikin Fit video, Coil has two super small strainers as you can clearly see them right there. 
Never by any means, never ever breeze these units without using nitrogen. Look at the oxide that came out of the lines that have been braced without nitrogen. This oxide can clog these tiny strainers and limit the system performance. The other components of the air handler are pretty straightforward. The communication board only requires four wires. We have two transformers here. One transformer is for the EEV and then the other one is for the controls. I can separate the two. The coil is full aluminum with three rows of bands. Inside the cabinet, the insulation is nice and tight. And the entire air handler is a lot heavier than the old communicating Daikin air handlers were back then. Do you really need dual fuel? Now, what does a typical heat pump do when the temperature drops so low that it can no longer generate heat? In the case of the Aurora, this threshold is minus 13 degrees. Now, the answer is simple. It will switch to auxiliary heat. So this particular system had a 10kW heater. On those very cold days, it will rely on auxiliary heat. While the auxiliary heat is not very efficient, typical COP rating is one to one, it does the job, especially if the dealer properly sized the heater. And besides, you're not really limited to a 10kW heater, you can have a 15kW heater that provides even more heat. So around the ski resort, many people use heat pumps as their primary heat source. For example, the house in the background has a heat pump only. That's me on the picture, and on that particular day, the temperature was at the record low of minus 19 degrees Fahrenheit, which is actually quite rare yeah. for this geographic location. I threw boiled water into the air as my son was filming me, and as you can see, it immediately vaporized. Now, was the indoor temperature comfortable? The heat pump was running an auxiliary heat only and still managed to maintain 57 degrees not very comfortable and this was without the help of a gas converted fireplace later on the day the indoor temperature returned to normal setting in the upper 60s and once the cold snap passed everything became comfortable again now keep in mind that this was a regular single stage old r22 heat pump with a 10 kw heater if it had a 15 kW heater, it would have performed just fine even at minus 19 degrees Fahrenheit. So we're circling back again. Do you really have to spend the extra money on a dual fuel system or not? In this case, the homeowner decided no. If the temperature dips below minus 13, when the Aurora can no longer efficiently heat, it will do what any other heat pump would do, switch to auxiliary heat. And this is the conclusion if the heater is properly sized based on thermal load of the house, there's absolutely no need for dual fuel. And that was the owner's decision, and I think he made the right choice. So if someone wants to break away from dual fuel system, I would definitely recommend consulting with an HVAC Pro. And at last but not least, special thanks for the inventors of Enhanced Vapor Injection, as well as Jennifer Granholm, and all the HVAC manufacturers who took the challenge and came up with cold climate heat pumps. Thanks for watching. See you next time.
Thank you.